Good morning, everyone. And it's our pleasure to uh, welcome today Dr. Craig Mello, the Nobel Prize recipient last year for the uh, co-discovery of RNA interference. And welcome to Google. Thanks. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and, uh, you know, I never, I never really uh, thought about what Google looks like on the inside. You know, I just see that interface. And, um, you know, it's, sorry. <laughs> Someone's on the phone. Um, all right, so I, I'm going to talk about today uh, information storage. Um, and uh, how it's stored inside of our cells. How do you make a, um, an organism like a human being uh, or even a simple little bacterial cell? Um, and there's a really remarkable, as you can imagine, uh, a really remarkable way uh, that that's accomplished. And uh, we're still trying to understand it. I mean, just looking at what, what organisms are capable of, like ourselves, um, you, you understand, of course, that there has to be a really remarkable way for that information stored in the DNA to be accessed and to interface with the environment to produce uh, such things as thoughts and ideas. Um, and so I'm going to start uh, by talking about uh, this RNA interference mechanism and uh, tell you a little bit about how that's shedding some new light on how information is stored inside of our, our cells. Um, <clears throat> here's uh, Andrew Fire and I. And I'd like to show this picture because I don't know if there's a, oh, here it is. Uh, because of this is taking place on the stage in Stockholm. Can I have the lights down in front? And uh, what we're doing here is um, not talking to each other. And that's, that's pretty remarkable, because Andy and I always talk whenever we're together. And uh, I like to show it, because people always ask, well, how do you win one of these prizes? And the answer really is by talking to people, by sharing your ideas. And I, I'm sure you guys do that a lot, but it's, it's particularly important, especially talking to somebody like Andy, uh, who is uh, you know, a wonderful person, full of uh, great ideas, and uh, without whom I certainly wouldn't have been there on the stage. But uh, it, I, I like to just remind you that when you have an idea, it's really good to test it out on your colleagues and your friends. And a lot of people I've found are much too uh, reserved or afraid of getting their ideas out there. And they tend to be a little too conservative about that. I think if anything had a big impact on my career, it was being willing to speculate and throw ideas out there, brainstorm. and that. That is uh, really the way the great um, discoveries are made, because the ideas don't necessarily come from inside your head. They come from the dialogue, from the discussion. And almost no one in the room can claim they, they thought of that, because it was the dialogue, it was the discussion that, that generated that idea. And so RNAi is a really, really remarkable story. And it has, there's so many people who've been involved in not only the laying the groundwork for the discovery that Andy Fire and I made, but also in the work subsequent to that that brought out the significance of the work that we had done. And I'm going to um, not spend a lot of time on the discovery process today. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. But I, I just want to launch into a, um, a, this following little clip from um, Nova Science Now. What if I told you that recently scientists made a discovery that's so surprising and so powerful? Not only are we about to know much, much more about how all these diseases work, Alzheimer's and asthma and arthritis and cancer and HIV and all the others, there's a chance, it's a real chance, that we can treat many of these diseases much more effectively, all because of this one discovery called RNA. I it was a little I at the end, which I'll explain later. You don't hear much about it, but RNAi is a really big deal. And the curious thing about it is the discovery of RNAi was an accident, it was a puzzle, that appeared in a petunia. It was a purple petunia. Now, um, I, I, I like this guy, uh, Robert Krolovich, because he's so enthusiastic 
Um, and uh, it really is true. RNAi is a big deal. Um, now, it, it, the mystery did first appear in a petunia, um, although we didn't know that it was related to RNAi until much later. Uh, what happened was researchers uh, were trying to make the petunia more purple, and when they put a gene in that encodes the, uh, the, one of the enzymes involved in making the uh, purple pigment, uh, instead of getting more purple, the flower became white. It lost all the pigment. Um, so there, in that case, they were adding an extra copy of a gene into the germline of the plant. This is a very powerful technology uh, because it allows you to change an organism. The only thing is the organism doesn't like to be manipulated and changed, and so it, it has ways of, in, of blocking the activity of, of genes that are added. Um, and that was totally mysterious at the time. No one had any idea how it worked. Um, and uh, it turns out much later that now we know this is related to RNAi. And I'll, I'll come back at the end of my talk to work on how we think it's related. But remember, this is adding double-stranded DNA uh, to the organism. And I'll talk a little bit about DNA and RNA because you guys probably aren't all that familiar with what they are. Uh, I'll just give you a little bit of a background on that um, in a minute. But first I have to introduce to you the, uh, the worm. And this is what C. elegans looks like. It's um, fortunately only a millimeter long. It's not quite this big. Um, it has a total of 1,000 cells whereas you and I have about 10 trillion cells, okay? So this is a really simple animal. And yet, it has neurons, it has muscles, it has gut, it has basically all the major tissue types that a human has. The other thing that's remarkable about this animal is that it has won five Nobel Prizes so far, <laughs> okay? And the pace is picking up because the last uh, one was in 2002 and now this 2006, but I, I think there'll be more for this organism. And one of the reasons it's such a useful organism is it's, compared to us, of course, remarkably simple. It lives uh, six days, roughly. It produces uh, 300 progeny during that time. Uh, it eats bacteria. You can grow it very rapidly in the laboratory. You can do genetics, which is basically introduce mutations using chemicals that will uh, randomly mutagenize the genome so that you can look at what uh, genes are important for the various pathways that work in the animal. So it's a great little model system. Now, you're probably asking, well, how can a worm tell, teach us anything? I mean, I sh should point out that the prizes were all in, in medicine, essentially. None. So how can a worm get five Nobel Prizes for medicine? Now, the, the, the answer to that uh, really goes back to uh, the very beginning of the universe. So this is a picture from uh, one of the, the uh, gentlemen, uh, uh, George Smoot and John Mather, actually, from uh, the COBE project, uh, which is the mapping of the background radiation from the Big Bang. And I throw this up here because when we were in Stockholm together, they, they won the prize in 2006 for their work on, on this project. What they had done was measure very carefully the temperature of the background radiation that's all through outer space. And this is a picture of what they got. This is the Milky Way galaxy, uh, which is basically in the way. Uh, sort of they measured the, the background, the heat from that as well. So they subtracted that, and that's what you get. Wherever you look out into outer space, you can see uh, remnants uh, here where you can measure the background radiation temperature. And that can give you an age for the universe. And the age they got is 13.7 billion years. So, and it, fit, it fits beautifully with the Big Bang theory. So the reason I'm throwing it up there is because we had to think of, you know, they all, the, we were talking to the media and they all wanted to know, well, what do you have in common? You know, tell us about science. And, you know, so we were on the stage together. And one of the, the concepts that became clear to us that was, I think, uh, really striking about this is that Life on this planet has a, a, arose about four, three and a half to four billion years ago, almost a quarter of the age of the universe. Living things on this planet are all related to a common ancestor that arose uh, about three and a half to four billion years ago. And so what I'm showing here are uh, the history of animals. Here's the ancestor of worms and humans. And as they diverge here, worms end up over here on this branch, humans over here. 
they split and um, there were these events that occurred in the history of life that caused massive extinctions. And these were glaciation events that extended all the way to the equator uh, based on the geological evidence uh, they can piece together that these events probably generated a planet that looked pretty much like that, covered with snow and ice right down to the equator. And um, those events, uh, well, the last of them occurred about 580 million years ago, right before the uh, Cambrian explosion that some of you have probably heard about, uh, where there was a rapid and, ma and massive diversification of animals with all kinds of interesting body parts that appear in the fossil record. Um, and what's, what's very interesting about this, and the reason I show it, is, is it points out that this rapid diversification of life can be interpreted as uh, resulting from the presence of an already highly sophisticated animal that existed prior to these events, but this animal was limited in its environmental range. It could not expand onto the land. It could not possibly evolve into anything like us because there was no land. There were no land plants. There was no land. Nevertheless, the organism that existed prior to this event already had RNAi. Humans have it. Worms have it. Flies have it. Just about everything uh, animal has it. E remarkably, even the common ancestor of plants and animals has RNAi. And if you look at the basic functionings of the cell, uh, the genetic code, for example, um, the bac a bacterial cell can read the human genetic code. So for example, my daughter has type 1 diabetes. Her insulin is made by bacteria. The human gene for insulin is put into the bacterial cell, and the bacteria makes functional, um, a functional human protein. Um, that is remarkable, OK? It really is. I mean, nobody could have predicted that when we started doing molecular biology um, you know, 50 years ago. So um, I show this because uh, it points out a few things. First of all, the reason worms and are, are a useful model is because the ancestor of worms and humans, which probably looked a lot like a worm, uh, is all, was already a highly sophisticated organism. It had muscles like our muscles. It had neurons like our neurons. It probably, uh, there's speculation it even had an eye sensing uh, sensor of some sort. So these animals were highly evolved, uh, highly sophisticated creatures. And so as we study how these simple organisms work, we're really learning about ourselves and how we work. And that's just a picture of what the Earth might have looked like at the equator of about 580 million years ago. Now here's what DNA looks like. I promise I give you a little bit of a primer. I know you had Watson here, too, so maybe you don't need this. But um, here's the, the DNA um, shown here with these base pairs. There's basically four different nucleotides, and that's all you need to encode uh, genes which are read out three nucleotides at a time and, in, and made into amino acids um, through a system I'll, I'll also illustrate to you in a moment. Um, so the, the discovery of DNA was a really, really major breakthrough for molecular biology. Um, because it told us for the first time how the genetic information is encoded in our cells. And it explained so much. It explained how the uh, information could be copied and inherited, because those two strands can unwind, and each strand can serve as a template for the production of a perfect copy of the other. And so you have this really, really amazing discovery that tells us how genetic information is stored, copied, and transferred from generation to generation. And I think the reason, of course, that I'm, I'm telling you this is that it became essentially this huge paradigm, this huge idea that we sort of went back and we interpreted everything uh, in terms of the DNA. The DNA is controlling everything. It's the brain of the cell. And now I'm, I'm going to say that we really are returning to this notion of an RNA world. and I'll. I'll uh, come to that in a moment. This is a cell dividing, and it's marked with a green fluorescent protein from jellyfish. So this is a, recomp this is a worm embryo, and that's a four-cell stage. This is the germline cell, and it's dividing. And as you can see, there are these uh, 
uh, pro this protein that's tagged with this green fluorescent ta uh, tag is localizing as we watch there directly um, into one cell at each division. So that's two cell stage and the protein appears here. Now this cell is the germline cell and the protein that's localizing is required for the germline to develop. What's remarkable about all these divisions is they're occurring without any transcription. The DNA is not doing anything. Um, all of these events are programmed um, by products that are put into the egg. So these, asymmet these unequal cell divisions in which that protein is localized, those are all occurring without the DNA having any input at all in any of the decisions. If it had any input, of course, it had to be by expressing the gene products that were then put into the egg and controlled all these events. Now, um, there was a time in the evolution of life when very likely um, Hopefully, it will come back to the slideshow here in a moment, where, um, where life was um, essentially molecules that were replicating. The in origin of life, of course, is mysterious because it's not still happening. Living things aren't still evolving from scratch on this planet because they, if to do so, they would have to compete with existing organisms that already um, occupy uh, the types of niche that a, 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 a molecular organism would have to occupy. So in the history of the Earth, there's, there was a time when molecules are thought to have replicated and had enzymatic uh, capacities of their own. And if you look at DNA, DNA is uh, essentially an inert molecule. It can't, under, it can't catalyze reactions. It can't copy itself. It could never um, essentially provide a mechanism for uh, molecular evolution, but RNA can do that because RNA can fold up into uh, structures that can catalyze reactions. In fact, there were Nobel Prizes awarded for uh, the ribozyme, for example, which is an RNA-based enzyme. Uh, so that's sort of the notion of an RNA world, is a world in which molecules were evolving based on uh, an RNA-like uh, nucleic acid. Now, what I like to say now is that this return to the RNAi world, and I like to say, we named RNAi for RNA interference, but I like to say that that little i can also mean information, RNA information. So DNA is not the only source of information. That, that was a beautiful model, but it's, it's probably wrong. There's actually information stored in our DNA that's in the three-dimensional interaction between the DNA the proteins and the RNA, and the RNA can actually encode information. So I'll tell you about that again toward the end of the talk. Now, um, when, you, when you're trying to explain something complicated like RNAi, especially if you want to do it uh, on the nightly news, you have to do it very quickly um, because everybody knows that there are you know, hundreds of channels, and whoever's watching is going to be flipping through them if they get bored. So it's really interesting to see how the news media handles something like RNAi. How do you uh, get this message across about what RNA interference is in you know, 15 seconds? Because that's what the, the attention span is for the average American viewer. So this is what CBS News came up with. And this is hilariously funny to scientists. But I think I've noticed when I give a talk to people who are not Biologists, quite often, they don't laugh. So I'll explain to you why, why this is funny. Here it comes. This aired on the news at 7. That's um, double-stranded RNA. Now watch carefully. <laughs> Those are defective genes flying into the RNA. I actually had to loop this part a few times, because uh, I think they actually did it in five seconds. Um, so what's, what's wrong with this picture? Well, genes don't really look like cheese curls. <laughs> and uh, RNA cannot chew. Um, so that's a, a little, they've took a little bit of license with this. Um, so they literally have the double-stranded RNA. Now, you, you probably know DNA is double-stranded. Well, RNA can form a double-stranded helical structure also. And uh, as I'll show you in the next 
slide, that can be seen as foreign or as a viral replication intermediate inside cells. So the double-stranded RNA would actually be on the same scale as the DNA. So DNA would actually be at least the same scale as the RNA in terms of its size. So they're not, they're not gonna look like these little cheese puffs flying into the mouth of the RNA. And RNA really cannot chew, it does not have muscles, it doesn't have the ability to do that. Um, but the funny thing is that as crazy as this seems, there's actually an example now of RNA interference uh, guiding the elimination of DNA um, in, a, in a really amazing way where the, R the RNAi marks the chromatin um, in the cells of, a, of an organism called tetrahymena. Um, it marks the DNA for, de for uh, deletion or for removal. And that, that's a really remarkable. There's a couple of examples, actually, in which RNAi-like mechanisms can actually guide the elimination of, of genes. But that's not how it works. So here's another model. This one is, again, from Robert Krulwich, uh, it's Nova Science So the now. theory is that long ago, cells developed a secret defense system which we will call the COP. What the COP does is when viruses invade and create showers of murderous recipes, the COP looks and thinks, hmm, some of these have a very fishy shape. It's a chemical difference, which comes down to some of the viral recipes are two pages instead of one, and one side is a mirror image of the other. But the point is, to the COP, there's something not right about this shape. So when they see it in that shape, they say, virus. This is they Eric say, Lander. Uh -oh, uh -oh. And the cop destroys the recipe. And when you say it destroys, is this, should we think like a kung fu kind of thing? Is it like sort of deal? Yeah, a little enzymatically, a little thermodynamics. Uh, enzymatically? Like that. Enzymatic kung fu, maybe, yeah. <laughs> the cop destroys not only the oddly shaped version, whenever he sees that recipe, oddly shaped, regular shape, that recipe in any form must be destroyed to defeat the virus. And the interesting thing is, until 1998, nobody knew that cells had this defense mechanism. So there you have another model. Um, this model uh, is actually one that I, I like a little bit more because even my six-year-old doesn't believe there's actually a little cop inside of her cell. Um, and so what you have there is those little messages that were floating around. RNA is essentially thought of as a message sometimes, as a copy of the DNA information. So inside the, the, the nucleus, you have the DNA, which encodes genes, and that is expressed in the form of RNA. So a copy of the DNA is made into RNA. The RNA can then go out into the cytoplasm and be made into protein. And the next movie I'll show will actually show you some sort of science, uh, science fiction-like pictures of how that, that would look. Um, but the, the nice thing about the cop is, again, that people won't mistakenly believe that there's really a cop inside their cells. Although my six-year-old does say to me, whenever she's sick, she's like, why isn't the cop stopping this virus? You know, She gets upset at it. Um, the cop isn't doing a very good job. Um, so uh, let, me, let me just go on now to this next movie. This is from Nature. And now we're going to fly into the cell. So the theory is that long ago. Oops, I went ago, back, sorry. We're going to fly in, inside of a cell and fly along into the nucleus. That's the nucleus. And now that's the DNA all coiled up. I'll come to the, that in a moment later on in my talk. Now here it is unwound into that beautiful spiral structure. Now here's when the polymerase jumps onto the DNA, it has to unwind. And it makes a copy that's uh, RNA. And RNA differs uh, only very slightly from DNA, really, in its chemical structure. Uh, and here's the RNA coming off the DNA. It gets modified. And this is splicing. That's another uh, interesting process, but it, it's not that important. I, I can answer questions about that if you want. Then polyadenylated, and it, it exits the nucleus, comes out into the cytoplasm, where it's going to encounter the translation machinery. So this has the information in it for making a protein. This enzyme, called a ribosome, goes along and it makes the protein encoded by this RNA. The protein then can fold up and do what proteins do. Now here's the scientist just injected some double-stranded RNA. It should really look like a spiral, too. It's a, it's a helical structure. 
It gets processed by this enzyme called Dicer. Then it gets loaded onto this enzyme called Slicer, and that will go away. It's not going to chew. I think that's where CBS got its uh, idea. Now, this is what Slicer does. It hunts for perfectly matched targets, and then it cleaves them. And once they're cleaved, uh, they can be destroyed and turned over. And the thing that's amazing about this slicer complex is it's catalytic, and it can hunt down rare targets in the cell and cleave uh, multiple different targets. So it's a way in which the um, animal uh, can, or plant, can turn off genes that have already been expressed. It can find them using this uh, small RNA. It's like, it's like when you do your Norton antivirus, you know, the, 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 vi the antivirus software has pieces of uh, virus code that are there and as signatures, and the program will run a search for those on your computer. If it finds them, it'll, it'll remove the code that contains that sequence. Well, the cell has a mechanism like that, too. It uses a piece of the sequence to hunt for any RNA that contains the same sequence. And 20 nucleotides, or 21 nucleotides, uh, which is how long those little pieces are, is long enough to find almost any sequence, uh, unique gene sequence in the cell. Um, uh, so it's, a, it's really an, an interesting and relatively uh, elegant mechanism. Now, when we st got interested in this mechanism, um, we got interested in it for a couple of reasons. But uh, first of all, this is a worm being injected. What we noticed was that the silencing effect, the introduction of RNA at, uh, into the animal, resulted in a heritable change. So not only were we affecting, uh, causing silencing among the first generation progeny, we were actually generating carriers that transmitted silencing via the egg or via the sperm uh, through multiple generations. So the heritable nature of the silencing that we were achieving, it's like you're trying, the mechanism I just showed you would, would involve silencing a gene um, essentially for a, um, uh, that had already been expressed. And you'd expect that to be transient because the DNA is not changed. Um, but instead, what we were seeing was silencing that lasted uh, for multiple generations and could be passed um, as like a dominant silencing factor. We also noticed that the silencing effect was systemic. So when we injected into, for example, the intestine, the silencing effect spread throughout the animal entered the germline, and then was inherited. And so these kinds of uh, mechanisms, inheritance and the, the systemic spread, indicated there was an active organismal response. And that, that to us was what made us, Andy and I, want to work on this, the fact that the animal was responding to the information and doing something. And so we did genetics. Uh, in C. elegans to find the genes involved in this mechanism. And that the genetics worked very well. I'm not going to take you through the mechanism, the genetics, but the, one of the genes we, we found encodes the COP. Um, and this is what the COP actually looks like based on the crystal structure of the protein, uh, which was just determined uh, in Limor Joshua Tor's lab at Cold Spring Harbor. Uh, the structure of the protein is shown here. The small RNA guide. It's about 21 nucleotides long is here. And that is held onto at both ends by this protein. And there's a groove in this protein, which is shown here in gray. And the protein uh, guides uh, the search that leads to base pairing between the purple RNA and the, the bluish RNA. And, and the, by virtue of the base pairing, pushes the RNA up against the catalytic center where the cleavage occurs. So, this process leads to the slicing of the message. And I showed you earlier in that little movie that the longer double-stranded RNA, first it gets diced. So it gets made into little pieces of 21 nucleotides. And then uh, that RNA can slice. And so it's like one of those late night commercials. You know, It dices, it slices. And RNAi really is like that, because just like those commercials, right when you're ready to buy the Ginsu knife or whatever, they always say, but there's more. Right? And they, then they throw in the steak knives. Well, that's how RNAi has been, uh, like, it's been like that to work on this. Because we thought this was so totally cool, so amazing. Uh, we were extremely excited by all of this. But there really was a lot more. And there is a lot more still coming. And that is uh, sort of illustrated in this slide, where 
this represents a tree, uh, sort of a, it's like almost like a family tree of the, 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 um, the argonaut proteins or the slicer proteins. RDE1 is the first member of this family that was identified as a component of RNAi. And when we clone a gene nowadays, the first thing we do is search on the, the databases for all the genes that are related to that gene. And this is, this is revolutionized um, molecular biology. I mean, the databases, you know, the genome sequences would be worthless if we couldn't search them quickly. And so what we do is we clone a gene like RDE1, and then we blast it, we call it blasting, against the genome sequence. And it comes back with all the genes that are related to this gene that we started with. And this is always very exciting for us because you basically get your foot in the door with the first gene you clone, and then by studying the family of genes, you can really learn a huge amount about what the, the um, functions are of this family. So RDE1 has a huge gene family. Um, and just in C. elegans, there are 26 members of the family. And uh, there, there are also members of the family that are in humans. There's four human members here. And they're closely related to two worm genes shown over here with the blue X through them. Uh, there's four more human genes over here that are related to C. elegans genes as well. In fact, this green branch of the family and this black branch of the family were both present already in the common ancestor of worms and humans. So way back there below the Cambrian, there was a common ancestor animal that had two copies of this gene already, at least. And uh, so these here are also found in all other animals, including fruit fly, for example. Uh, members of this family are very ancient, and they also appear in plants. So RD1 is sort of right here in the middle on this diagram. And then there's a big group of, of genes that are only present in C. elegans that have been uh, an amplified family of, of genes whose functions uh, we're also analyzing. So we got RD1. And then we, we asked, what, ha, what are these other genes for? So when you knock out RDE1, there's no RNA interference left. You can inject double-stranded RNA all you want. There's no silencing that occurs. That's how we found it, as a, a mutant defective in RNAi. Um, and, and so we wondered, what are, the, what are all these other genes doing? Could they be involved, for example, in endogenous mechanisms that might be important uh, for you know, gene silencing mechanisms that might be important for development? And so we knocked them all. We've all actually knocked out all these genes now uh, from C. elegans, um, in, and we are currently analyzing their functions. But to tell you about um, sort of why we were very excited when we knocked out those two with the X through them in the last slide, I have to mention uh, work from Victor Ambrose, who identified an endogenous gene that makes a hairpin molecule like this. So this is a gene that's expressed just like any other protein encoding gene in the nucleus. It's a piece of DNA. It has what we call a promoter, where the polymerase can land and start making that copy. But instead of encoding a, a protein, this, this gene encodes a little RNA that folds into a hairpin. And it makes a double-stranded structure that can be uh, essentially recognized by the RNAi machinery. And we knew about this gene because it was discovered in 1993. And a second member of this family, this is Lin4, LET7 was discovered in, in about 2000 uh, by Gary Rovkin's group. And the remarkable thing about these genes is that they're processed into short RNAs of 21 nucleotides uh, in length. So in the mature, in the, in the wild type animal, the mature form is what you see in cells. If you extract the RNA and you probe it, you see this short 21 nucleotide RNA. This is a gel in which the nucleic acids have been separated according to their size. So you can see the small RNA down at the bottom and the precursor up at the top. And so what we, what we found when we knocked out members of this argonaut family, these uh, RDE1 homologs, is that the precursor accumulated and the mature product was uh, depleted. And the phenotype that resulted was very similar to knocking out the LET7 gene. So this, why was this so exciting? Well. From RNAi, initially we had thought it was some sort of a viral or defense mechanism in the cell. These genes are regulators of other genes that function in the process of controlling development. And um, in fact, what they do is they base pair with, the, with other target genes. They, we now call them microRNAs. And in 2000, 
uh, when LET7 was first described, uh, these were thought to be essentially a C. elegans specific phenomenon, just another wor weird thing that worms do. Um, but it turned out that LET7 was identical at every single nucleotide in its 21 nucleotide length to a human gene now called LET7. So humans have LET7. That means that common ancestor of worms and humans uh, close to a billion years ago, 700 million, let's say, had already um, a microRNA gene like LET7. And in, indeed, the target of LET7 is conserved in humans as well. But even more remarkable, we thought we had the whole genome sequence there. We thought we knew where all the genes were. Well, it turns out that about 1% of the genes are actually um, these short hairpin encoding genes. So there's at least 1,000 of these genes in the human. And we didn't even know about them until 2000. So that's an example of how all of a sudden there was more. And so it turns out that these, these microRNA genes, as we call them now, drive gene silencing during normal development. And interestingly, this I just learned uh, earlier this year, um, they're turning out to be extremely important in cancer. Um, so here's an example of, again, a profiling, profiling work that's been done where these are tumor samples from a couple hundred patients. And on this axis are different microRNAs uh, so these are different human genes encoding microRNAs. And what you see in red are their relative, red or green uh, shows the relative levels. Are they upregulated or are they downregulated in these tumor samples? And you can look at the different tumor samples and you can see that they're very different profiles. Some, these patients have uh, lots of red, as you can see. These have a lot of green. So these indicate that different tumors have different levels of microRNA expression. And through this, these patients can be correlated in terms of their, their outcomes with the profile of microRNA expression. In some cases, microRNAs um, through this type of work uh, can be linked to a, a phenotype. And uh, I'll just quickly, uh, a phenotype in the sense of how, how the tumor responds. And just briefly, in some experiments uh, recently, it's been shown that if you use a microRNA inhibitor, you can prevent the growth. Here's one that received the inhibitor. Here's the control. You can prevent the growth of a tumor in, in a mouse. This is, this is another example of the great technology we have now. This is whole body imaging, where you can actually look inside the animal using a, um, a, a machine that can detect uh, the fluorescence right through the, the body of the, of the animal imaging techniques. That, allow you to look at the tumor inside the animal. And you can see that this animal, the tumor growth has been inhibited, whereas in the control, it hasn't. So that's an example of how there's a lot more, there's a lot more coming from that because we just learned about these kinds of RNAs. And now it turns out that there are microRNAs that are involved in suppressing tumor growth. And there are others that become activated or turned up um, in tumors. And those actually um, are, are um, essentially oncogenic. They turn on cell growth. So um, now there is, just like those late night commercials, there's still more. And I'm going to show you this uh, gel here. This is, this is what RNA looks like when you run it out on a gel and stain it with a, a dye. You can see these abundant RNA species. These are actually structural RNAs that play a role in the protein translation process, uh, tRNAs, uh, are primarily what are here, and these are involved in trans, in reading the genetic code. So these are very famous RNAs we've known about for a really long time. But way down on the bottom of these these kinds of gels, there was always you know little bands of RNA that everybody thought was just junk, and it was like running down near the bottom of the gel. So everyone ignored it. Of course, then microRNAs came along and people started paying attention to the bottom, bottoms of these gels. And it turns out that way down here in wild type worms, you can see an, a band that's present. And what made us take notice of this band is that in these mutants shown here that are defective in RNAi, that band goes away. And it's, it turns out that that band is 22 nucleotides long. And it's, it's interesting in that unlike, and this probably doesn't mean anything to you, but it has a five prime triphosphate instead of a monophosphate, which 
distinguishes it from uh, the microRNAs, for example, and, and other types of dicer products. We were very intrigued by this, this small band um, and wanted to know what it was. Uh, there's another one there as well. Now, what we found was that these types of small RNAs are detectable also by, um, when you make a, a probe, uh, you can detect these small RNAs. This is looking at the small RNA itself in a wild-type worm. And what's interesting about these is they are a complementary to target genes in the, in the cell. And here's an example of a target gene, uh, K02 messenger RNA, K02 silencing RNA. And you can see that in wild-type animals, there's a high level of the silencing RNA and a low level of the message. So this gene is being down-regulated by this siRNA. And this is a naturally occurring silencing RNA. This is not experimentally induced. This is derived just naturally from worms that are just living. That's how they live. Now, if you knock out RNAi, this target RNA goes way up, and the, uh, the small RNA goes away. So these, these mutants have uh, upregulation of this message and a down. And these, by the way, are sterile mutants as well. So it, it's an essential gene. So uh, Wei Feng in the lab recently cloned this RNA species. He made uh, thousand, thousands of copy, cDNAs, we call them, copies, and then sequenced them. And we're this is something that's still ongoing because um, these are, even though they're kind of faint on this gel, they are incredibly abundant. Um, and I'll just show you them a little more clearly here uh, in this procedure that uh, radio labels them. Uh, so you can see this 22 nucleotide siRNA species that's present in wild type and it's absent in this DRH3 mutant. Um, and Wei Feng uh, essentially isolated this band and uh, cloned it. And um, so some of his preliminary data uh, is shown here. Uh, we have many more uh, sequencing reads that are coming in now because we're doing these high throughput sequencing uh, techniques. Among 11,000 of these uh, that, he've, that we've looked at, um, they're all 20 tumor, uh, of, the, of these 48,000 reads, 11,000 are 20 tumors. 98% for some reason start with a, a G residue, um, and we don't really know what the significance of this is. Um, we've blasted a set of these, um, and we're still analyzing uh, this data some more, but approximately half of these are complementary to genes in the, in the animal. And of those, uh, approximately, uh, well, almost all of those that are, that are target genes are antisense to the genes. That means that the RNA that we've identified would base pair with the target RNA, just like the silencing RNAs do during RNAi. So they're behaving like you might expect for an RNA that would regulate those thousands of different genes. So we have 3, 000, roughly 3,000 different small RNAs that target um, almost 3,000 different genes, just from the small amount of sequencing we've done so far. And some of them, most of them will only have one hit, as you can imagine, because we've only sequenced uh, 3,000 and we have 2,700 different uh, genes identified. But some of them stack up on uh, targets. This gene, for example, has, um, so I forget how many, something like 100 different microRNA or small RNAs, these are not microRNAs, that hit uh, all along the coding region of this particular gene. So some genes have multiple small RNAs, others have only a single small RNA. What's going on? Why, why are we seeing an abundant small RNA species that is complementary to most, perhaps, uh, if we extrapolate, perhaps most of the genes. There's 20,000 genes uh, in the animal. We've sequenced um, about 3,000 of these that, that identify genes, and so far we've hit over um, 2,000 different genes. So what's going on? Now this is the DNA again, and I'm just showing you this because this is how the crystal structure of DNA looked when Watson and Crick determined it 50-some uh, years ago. But that's not how it looks inside the cell. Inside the cell, the DNA is, is bundled up and very compacted 
Uh, otherwise, it, it just wouldn't fit inside the nucleus. So the DNA in, your nucle in the nucleus of your cell is bundled up into these uh, fibers called chromatin. And the chromatin actually um, is, when you unwind it a little bit, you can see there's these little balls, which we call nucleosomes, blown up here. And the nucleosome consists of a protein core in the center and the DNA wrapped twice around that core. You can see it in this other view here. So here's the genetic information wrapped around uh, these protein cores. And sticking out from the central protein core, there are these tails um, of amino acids, essentially protein tails, that are sites for regulatory modifications of the chromatin. Now, what uh, has been emerged from the analysis of these uh, tail structures that stick out is that the a lot of information can be put into those um, the amino acids there that control how compact or how open the uh, the DNA is and how accessible it is to um, to be expressed in the cell. The more compact generally, the less uh, well expressed that gene will be. And so here's just sort of a model. Uh, for um, the, the way that DNA um, is, is stored. In an active gene, the DNA is in a more open conformation, allowing the polymerase complex to get on and make the messenger RNA. Now, what's emerging that's very exciting from the RNAi uh, studies around the world um, is that the, even the silent regions of the, of the genome are not really silent, that there's actually RNA expression that goes on to regulate the DNA. And so we call these kinds of RNAs surveillance RNAs. And there's a couple of ways they can enter the RNAi pathway. One way is by making bidirectional transcripts from the chromatin, chromatinized or silent region to make these dsRNAs that then get processed by dicer, loaded onto slicer, and then go back and, uh, tar and, and in this case, recruit a chromatin remodeling enzyme, this complex here, that can put these silencing marks on to those tails. So in the active region, there are very few of the silencing marks. And in fact, there are other marks that are involved in activating uh, gene expression. Within the silenced regions, there's lots of these silencing marks. And there's enzyme complexes that can put them there. And so you have this feedback loop where these silent regions can generate silencing RNAs that can feed back and reestablish silencing. Now, what they can do, what can be accomplished with this is that all of the copies of a gene family can be coordinately regulated in this way. So if you have uh, multiple copies of a gene that are distributed over many chromosomes, you can, you can see that these uh, siRNAs can go back not only to this target gene, but to other genes in the genome and achieve regulation. Furthermore, what's accomplished uh, is that you can achieve some degree of silencing even within the active region. So a gene that's active might generate a little bit of siRNA by virtue of having uh, lower levels of, of the surveillance transcription. And so this is actually what we think uh, these small RNAs we've detected might be um, participating in. In other words, um, essentially, uh, genes that are more active have low number, low levels of these. Genes that are more silent have very high levels of, of these uh, siRNAs. And uh, perhaps this type of feedback regulation allows the, uh, the genome to be um, regulated in this heritable way. And so this is where uh, the RNA uh, in the idea of RNA information storage comes in. You have a not only gene expression to express the gene, but uh, RNA is, is synthesized to silence the gene. And those mechanisms allow the organism to essentially um, pr uh, produce uh, variation in gene expression levels that are not correlated with any change at the DNA level. So think about this, for example. When, when your cells differentiate, you, they become different for the whole, your whole lifetime. If you're lucky, you'll live you know, 80 years, and your skin will stay skin. Your neurons will stay neurons. Otherwise, you, you, know, you run into trouble. But if you, if you look at what's going on inside those cells, even though they have very different phenotypes that are very stable over many, many years, the DNA is still the same. Um, and the, the, 
best examples of this are like Dolly the sheep and, and these other organisms uh, like mice, which are now routinely cloned. We can take a cell that's from the soma, a somatic cell from the body, a, a skin cell or a blood cell, and we can change that back into an embryo or essentially take the nucleus from that cell, put it back into an embryo, and the nucleus gets reprogrammed and so that it can make a whole embryo again. So the idea is that this mechanism, uh, that these small RNAs exist in uh, the cells of, in the germ cells in particular, and stem cells in addition, uh, and that they play an important role in programming uh, the DNA. So in essence, the, the concept is that the RNA uh, basically can regulate the DNA such that you can get heritable changes in gene expression that are maintained stably through hundreds of cell divisions, uh, thousands of cell divisions, without um, any um, underlying change in the DNA. So there's information stored in the interactions between these proteins that the DNA is spooled around and the RNA molecules that can feed back and modify those, those tails by virtue of these um, uh, proteins that they interact with. So, uh, in other words, it's not as simple as your genes are all in your DNA. If you sequence the DNA of a skin cell, it's going to be the same as the DNA of a neuron, but obviously those two cells are very different in their, in their functions, in their phenotype. And so what we've learned, I think, from the RNA eye uh, world is that RNA never really gave up control of the DNA. The DNA is like the hardware and the RNA and the proteins are the programming. So you're programming the computer in many, many different ways, and you're able to achieve all these sophisticated different types of cells. Um, and it's, it's uh, changes that are occurring uh, without any underlying changes in the DNA. Now, one other thing that's interesting about this concept is it can ex help explain differentiation of cells uh, during embryogenesis, but it can also potentially explain evolutionary change. And that's something that's very exciting right now that's also very, very speculative, but I think exciting from the standpoint of explaining how organisms could evolve rapidly without waiting for cosmic radiation or whatever to change nucleotides uh, in their DNA. They can change this programming cycle, this feedback loop could be enhanced or suppressed, and that can achieve heritable changes uh, much more rapidly, perhaps, than uh, actual mutations in the DNA sequence. So, and, and right now, another project that we're doing in the lab is uh, sequencing uh, from mice. We've identified, this is a bad blot, but there's a band here in the mouse ES cells. These are embryonic stem cells from mice, and you can see this band is present uh, in the mouse, and we're, we're analyzing uh, the sequences of those uh, RNAs now as well in the mouse. And um, I think I'll, these are just some of the people in the lab. I've, mentioned the people whose work I talked about already. This is the RNAi crowd here in the lab. Let me just skip over them quickly. I'm going to show you a few slides from Stockholm. This was a great time in Stockholm. This is um, uh, Hans Jornval who makes the phone call. And that's my wife, Edit, and Andrew Fire with his wife, Rachel. And uh, when, when uh, this nice gentleman called, my wife uh, rudely hung up on him at 4 a.m. Um, and uh, fortunately, he called back. Um, so I told him to call me anytime. It was a very nice guy. These are some of the other people I talked about, George Smoot and John Mather. That's uh, Ed Phelps, um, Roger Kornberg. Um, this is a representative from the Gromain Bank. And this is Mohammed Yunus and uh, Orhan Pamuk the author. Uh, these guys won for the Peace Prize. Um, they didn't spend much time with us. We only saw them this one day. Um, but we had a great time um, with the rest of these guys, mostly waiting in line to uh, shake the hand of the king and the queen and stuff like that. And this is um, my, some of my family up on the stage in Stockholm. That's my little brother, Roger. Thank goodness he was four years younger than me. Um, there, there we are with the royal family. Uh, this is uh, talking with students there at the um, uh, one of the events. These students won their respective science prizes from their countries, so the, they're quite bright, <laughs> interesting kid and kids from all over the world. Just more pictures with the prize and all that kind of stuff. Here's my wife getting some economics advice. 
Um, and here she's giving some advice, uh, probably how to spend money, do you think? <laughs> um, and here's uh, George Smoot explaining the Big Bang um, to me. And I, you can tell from my look, I'm not getting it. Uh, <laughs> this is my daughter, Victoria, collecting prizes of her own. And these are really uh, nice prizes because they're filled with chocolate. Um, and there we're dancing. And you can see what a great dancer she is. <laughs> So expressive. Now, here's the danger about getting one of these things is this is signing the bottom of a chair for some reason. And you can see what's happened here. The head is much bigger than the rest of the body. <laughs> <laughs> this, is some, this is a major danger. Um, but I, I'll tell you right now that it really, uh, as, as much fun as it was uh, to be, to be um, participating in this. It was really a celebration of the science. It wasn't, it wasn't about us. Um, and it was um, really, uh, really a wonderful experience. But coming back from this, um, there was another side to this. And I show this picture because this is Tara Bean, who was in a normal third grader in 1998, the year that Andy and I published our paper. Um, but unfortunately, uh, in a routine eye exam, she was uh, had a vision uh, loss in vision that was detected. And she went into uh, our hospital at UMass, where she was diagnosed with uh, essentially an inoperable brain tumor. Um, and she died uh, shortly thereafter in that year. So uh, that was about um, eight years ago. I was recently at the high school in um, our town where I, I showed this slide, and a lot of the kids in the room actually knew this, this girl when they were in third grade. Um, and um, it was a really emotional experience um, to, to be there and to, to feel that, the quietness in the room. Now, I took this slogan, Together Great Things Are Possible, from the Tara Bean Foundation website. They are now a charitable organization which is dedicated to treating uh, brain tumors and, and um, cancer in children. And um, the family of Tara ha have, have become good friends of ours now. Um, and what happens when you get a prize like uh, something like this for RNEI is all of a sudden, everyone in the world who's got a sick child or a sick family member starts emailing you and calling you. Because RNEI is seen by many as an opportunity to intervene in and cure genetic diseases. And it, it is an opportunity, but at the same time, it's one who's, uh, ha it hasn't really been realized yet how to do it. There are many problems, many barriers. So when you come back from this uh, experience, this wonderful experience, you, you really get this, also this other more serious side of wanting to get involved and help make a difference. Um, by doing more research, by developing RNAi as a therapeutic at UMass, we're, we're beginning to do develop an RNAi therapeutic center. I think I'll just um, end um, by saying a little poem that I read at the um, Tara Bean uh, Foundation fundraiser, because I think it's pertinent for all of us. It's called "Anything Is Possible," and you know, kind of funny. I found this poem by Googling it. Okay. So, and the author is anonymous. So somewhere out there, there's a Google, uh, there's an author that we need to find. If there was ever a time to dare to make a difference, to embark on something worth doing, it is now. Not for any grand cause necessarily, but for something that tugs at your heart, something that's your dream, for someone that you love, for someone who inspires you, for Tara. You owe it to yourself to make your days here count. Have fun, dig deep, stretch, dream big. Know, though, that things worth doing seldom come easy. There will be good days, and there will be bad days. There will be times when you want to turn around, pack it up, and call it quits. Those times tell you that you are pushing yourself, that you are not afraid to learn by trying. Persist. I lost my uh, slide. Oh, there it is. Persist. That's what I'm going to do right now. I had a hard copy. Persist, because with an idea, determination, and the right tools, you can do great things. Let your instincts, your intellect, and your heart guide you. 
trust, believe in the incredible power of the human mind, of doing something that makes a difference, of working hard, of laughing and hoping, of lazy afternoons, of lasting friends. The start of something new brings the hope of something great. Together, great things are possible. Thank you. Be happy to take questions if you have any. Uh, can you recommend any sort of popular science books on maybe this or other recent advances in molecular biology, sort of like uh, Brian Greene's book on string theory, uh, that kind of thing? Uh, there aren't any books yet. Um, so. You'll have to wait a little while. There are a lot of uh, good reviews, though. Um, so if you want to look for sort of lay, uh, in, written in layered terms and so on, you can find a lot of sort of short reviews uh, that talk about the R RNAi. They, they don't really, there's not a good one yet that really goes into all the different ramifications. So um, hopefully that will be coming soon. I'm thinking about writing one, but we'll see. I have a question. It's not on. Hello? Can you hear? Can I have a question about this fingerprinting, the 22 nucleotide. Yeah. That seems like a really small number. And, and how, how is it that that matches you know, good versus bad and so on? Any idea? Uh, which fingerprinting? The one where I showed you the heat map, the colored thing, or the? The, uh, the, the matching of these 22 nucleotide things on, on you know, ah. The number of sequences so far is small only because we haven't uh, increased the number. It's very expensive to do these experiments. We don't, the older technology was um, $10,000 for a sequencing run. So when we did one run, we actually split it into different samples. So we don't have as much data as we need yet. Um, but you're right, I mean, this, this could be a much larger amount of data um, to analyze ultimately because not only are you talking about um, maybe millions of sequences instead of uh, 40,000, uh, you're going to be looking at different sequences from different tissues. So you'll want to look at neurons, for example, and, and muscle and different cells and look at what their RNA, small RNA composition is. Um, and you'll want to look at tumors or you'll want to look at disease tissue. Or, so there's a, a huge amount of information that's going to be coming in the form of not just the DNA sequence of, of a person, but of their, of their various tissues that might be um, affected by some pathology. So you'll want to look at not only the normal patient, but also the, the, the tissues that have the disease state that you're interested in studying. So there'll be a huge amount of information that will come from this uh, kind of analysis in the future. The machines are now much cheaper, too, so we can actually buy one and use it ourselves instead of having to pay 10000 for one run. Next question. Um, I have a question about the, the sort of the COP and the 21-length uh, um, sequences. Does this have anything to do with um, vaccines and how they work? Um, no, it, it doesn't have any so far to do with vaccines um, in that vaccines are uh, usually pieces of the viral protein. So in, in order to, uh, our bodies have a really great uh, immune system based on uh, formation of proteins called antibodies that can bind to viral surface proteins. Those proteins cannot bind to or react to the viral RNA itself. So if the virus succeeds in getting in and setting up shop inside of our cells, uh, there's really no way to fight it. Uh, using protein at that point. It's already in your cell. So uh, there's another mechanism that involves this kind of RNA level or, or silencing the code of the virus. And the viruses um, also have ways of defeating it. So you can imagine that's why you still get sick. Um, yeah, it seems like there's a lot of databases and a lot of good software out there already, although it's kind of fragmented. Um, what do you think Google can do to help out? Well, uh, that, I think Google could uh, have a, a big role to play um, in that you know, the, the whole, the, there's a future coming 
where the amount of information, it could be that you know, we have one genome sequence now or maybe a couple from the human, uh, but it could be that uh, in the future we'll all have our genome sequences done. Um, that'll be part of your routine checkup. Um, it's, I think it's coming if, uh, if we don't screw up something else like global warming or whatever, but um, you know, if, if uh, it's, it's possible. And then there'll also be information that you can get from the microRNA expression profiling, like the tumor samples I showed you, as well as uh, small RNAs of other types, like the ones involved in regulating the DNA that I ta told you about. So remember, there's the microRNAs that are encoded by the genome, and then there's these small RNAs that are present that, that seem to be regulating the DNA. That's a different type of regulation. Well, we're going to have a huge amount of information from those various sources that we'll need to be able to search through. And I was suggesting when um, uh, Peter visited my office earlier um, that we name it, um, name a site Google Genome or something, where you can basically take your flop, your disk from, or your, your information from your checkup and plug it into your computer and load it onto Google Genome and it'll tell you what vitamins you need to take and, you know, that you better get an appointment with a doctor for this condition or that. There's a lot of possibility. It's a huge amount of information and you guys are the best at handling information. So um, I think it's a great opportunity for you to take a leading role in that. Next question. Hi. Um, you talked about the... Um flower in the beginning of the purple. Yeah, the petunia. Right. Yeah. Um, do you have any thoughts about um, gene modification for props, uh, crops and how that's going to make a difference? Yes. It can make a huge difference. It's already um, being done. Um, you know, Monsanto took a license to our um, technology. Um, I know they're working on some interesting stuff. There was a news story recently about uh, cotton in which the cottonseed oil is now edible um, because they've used RNAi to turn off a gene involved in producing the uh, some sort of a terpenol or something that makes it taste horrible. Um, so whether or not that cotton plant will do well in the wild, it's possible that that also makes it taste bad to um, to predators or not predators, but to animals that would otherwise eat the cotton seeds. Um, but it's a possibility. There's tremendous uh, opportunities to change living things now, not only using RNAi, but with genetic engineering um, to make uh, more productive crops, crops that will grow in areas where there are less, uh, you know, less water and so on. It's tremendous opportunities. And again, it's that horse race. You know, do we really want to be going there? You know, the, the fact is we're going to have to go there if we don't do something about population growth. Um, we have so many people, how are we going to feed them? Um, so science again can come to the to the rescue, maybe. But you know, who knows what problems the the new solutions will cause down the road? So it's one of those uh, interesting sort of uh, potentially very beneficial uh, applications of RNAi is in agriculture. Um, but again, it'd be much nicer if we could just organically grow food and feed the whole world. But I don't think we can do that, unfortunately. Any other questions? Okay. Thanks.